Um, his, you know, I'll, I'll mention something, if I may, which I find interesting. If you look at history over, you know, 800 years, gold is not the best inflation hedge. On a relative basis, compared with other things, gold underperforms during inflations, but it is a, yeah. it is a very good deflation hedge. Um, and that's because deflation is often associated with monetary uh, upheaval of some type. Well, that's it, folks. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Wow, I'm getting, I'm getting good at this. You know, I was doing 15-minute videos, and now, you know, I got it down under a minute. Wow. This is, uh, this is good. We're doing good. All right, all right, all right. You caught me. I, I, I didn't put this video off for so long just to give you a 35-second clip and call it a day. But I did want to lead with this clip specifically out front for a reason. Adrian Day isn't some nobody in the gold space. He's the portfolio manager for Euro Pacific Capital, as I pointed out. Why does that fund sound familiar to you? Well, because it's the fund founded by vocal gold bug and perpetual dollar bear Peter Schiff. You might remember Schiff from my video on the dollar milkshake theory. It is almost poetic that Schiff, a perma gold bull, has a guy on his payroll that openly counters his narrative for owning gold. But that is the deep down dirty secret about gold. All these hedge fund managers talk about it as an inflation hedge, but is it really? Adrian Day doesn't think so, and he makes a living getting investors like you and I to buy this stuff by the truckload. That is what we're going to discuss today. Gold, what is it good for? Well, not absolutely nothing, but it isn't for what everyone is led to believe it is. In Campbell Harvey and Claude Erb's landmark paper, The Golden Dilemma, the two men came to the conclusion that gold isn't an effective inflation hedge or even a hyperinflation hedge. So what uh, Claude Erb and I did in our paper, The Golden Dilemma, was to look at the behavior of gold over the very long term. Like I'm talking really long term, 3,000 years. So basically we came up uh, with the idea that uh, over the extreme long term, uh, the real price of gold is approximately constant. So we often hear that gold acts as a hedge against inflation, against the US dollar, but you have a different perspective of what the role of gold is. Uh, indeed. So our paper, The Golden Dilemma, actually explores these, um, what should I call them, stories that people tell. So what Claude and I actually did is to look at the data and test whether gold provides a hedge against unexpected inflation. And the evidence is, is not very convincing. Uh, we could find no significant relation. Uh, and, and even in extreme situations like hyperinflations, and we documented uh, a number of hyperinflations, hyper over 50 of them, that it was hit or miss. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But many investors buy gold expecting currencies to fail. So what do you think of that investment strategy? So a again, uh, it's, it's a simple matter of going to the data. So we look at, uh, in, in uh, the golden dilemma, we look at about seven different currencies. And there is no significant evidence that gold is an effective hedge in terms of currency. So even if there were to be a devaluation of the U.S. dollar, would gold not necessarily perform well? That, the key word is necessarily. So maybe it would and maybe it's, you get lucky and maybe it doesn't. So, so again, we looked at a number of different uh, situations, uh, not just the U.S. dollar, but, but international uh, currencies. Um, for example, we looked at uh, a period in Brazil, a 20-year period. So not just like two and a half years, like the Weimar Republic and the German hyperinflation, but this is a 20-year period where the average inflation rate was like 250%. Uh, percent. So it's huge in inflation. And gold, uh, basically, you, you lost. Um, you lost 60%. And, and if you had held the Brazilian currency over that period, you would have lost almost everything, but you wouldn't do that. You'd be investing in Brazilian um, interest rate bearing deposits or buy US dollar, that's simple enough. So it's unreliable. Campbell makes a great point that even in hyperinflation scenarios, gold really isn't that great of an investment. 
We see that in our modern world where in places like Argentina, Russia, Brazil, and others, the average person there uses the U.S. dollar. Why? Because you can carry it much easier, secure it much easier, it can be transferred digitally, and is far more fungible. It is also the reason you see cryptocurrencies being far more widely adopted than gold. For the average citizen, you can't use gold in your average life for purchases. Crypto and USD can, and that is why you see both widely used in developing countries. So if gold isn't a good inflation hedge, what is gold a hedge against? So your co-author Claude Herb recently came out with a correlation between interest rates and gold. He came out saying that if we look at 10-year treasury yields, and if they rise to 5%, then gold could fall back down to around $470 an ounce. Do you agree with him? So, so let's just rewind as to what that means. If you look at recent history, there is a remarkable correlation between yields and the price of gold. And we document this in our paper, The Golden Dilemma. So, so it basically means as the yield goes up, the price of gold goes down. So if you believe that the correlation will continue like it is in the future, then it suggests that a 4% interest rate means gold goes below $1,000. I decided to actually look at the graph of uh, a government bond and the price of gold. The reason being that these two things should not move in tandem. They should actually move quite opposite from each other, depending on whether expectations about inflation were high or deflation were high, right? So in a high inflationary environment, obviously a long dated bond, uh, government bond, would actually be very, very unattractive because when you finally get your money repaid to you in 25 years or 30 years, you're gonna be receiving the same amount of dollars, but they will have much less purchasing power in a high inflation environment. So bonds are gonna be very, very unattractive when inflation is high. And gold conversely in that environment should actually do well if it is in fact a hedge against inflation. Conversely, if it's a deflationary environment, you would think that bonds would do really, really well because you're gonna be paid back with uh, dollars that have greater purchasing power. So uh, the idea is that gold and bonds should always sort of move counter to each other if they are actually very, very different things that perform well in very, very different macroeconomic environments. For those among you who are more visual learners, have a look at this graph. This is a graph of TLT and GLD. What is TLT, you may ask? TLT is a basket, it's the largest basket in the world of US government debt of a long duration, I think 20 years plus. I think the average maturity is 26 years and I think the duration is actually a little over 19 and a half. The point is it is a, a basket of a US government bonds, right? So these are things that are gonna do very, very badly in a high inflationary environment for the reasons I just alluded to. And the other price series is actually uh, GLD and as implied by the ticker, that's a basket of gold bullion. Uh, so it is just a pile of gold. You would assume that these things would be decoupled in uh, periods over the last five years when inflation fears were on the rise. You would expect that gold would rise in price and TLT would plummet in price. And conversely, if we thought that deflation was gonna be a thing, TLT should spike in price and gold should do moderately badly in that, in that environment. Turns out though that actually these things have walked hand in hand quite nicely together over the last five years. And because I'm that kind of data-driven nerd, I actually ran a correlation analysis on the two and found a very strong positive relationship between the price of gold and the price of TLT. Uh, the R value I think is about 0 0.905, 906 I wanna say. Either way, it's a really, really tight correlation. To help break down what was said, and I may get into this deeper in another video, People have this misconception that low treasury yields mean loose money and inflation, which isn't true. Low yields means a weak economy. Likewise, bonds have their highest face value when yields are low. This is because the future economic outlook is gloomy and rates could go lower as people flee to the safety of government notes. So the value of off-the-run bonds, government debt that has already been sold, is higher than on-the-run bonds, new government debt at the lower rate. This is part of what is known as interest rate risk or bond risk. The value of bonds fluctuates based on the coupon interest rate of the bond. So gold following the face value of off-the-run treasuries 
suggests it is a deflationary hedge, not an inflationary hedge. Okay, so if gold is a deflation hedge, why is it a deflation hedge? Of the dear audience, two a little bit longer slams that do also correspond to another kind of collateral sale. And so the graph that I've pulled up right now is the gold price, that's the gold line. And then the little bars, the area graph at the bottom, that represents US treasuries, but custody holdings by the Federal Reserve for foreign official and international accounts. Jeff, you'll do a much better job explaining that. Can you just tell the audience what these things are and why they're important? US treasuries in custody. That is the uh, reserve managers around the world who, as you know, the euro dollar system developed and, and threw off all of these dollar resources into various countries, a lot of those dollar liabilities or dollar assets got in, became into the hands of foreign official uh, institutions, whether they be central banks or foreign treasuries or something like that. And as an accommodation to help out foreign governments around the world, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York custodies those U.S. Treasury assets on their behalf. So it actually acts, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York actually acts as custodian for these uh, Treasury accounts. And there's not just Treasury, there's other assets too, but we're, we're specifically dealing with Treasuries here. And if you, if you graphed the absolute value of those, what you see is they rise rapidly during the, the Euro dollar mania era up until the first financial crisis. And then we get into the post-2008 period, it gets a little strange, where we see the level of treasuries in custody at Federal Reserve Bank of New York on behalf of foreign officials tends to decline when we see these other kinds of, of indications of a dollar shortage. And so it, it goes together with the tick data in that, and this is separate from tick, it goes together in the data, the tick data where it says, treasuries tend to disappear from foreign hands when there's a dollar shortage. And yeah, we have, you know, we can go back to all those, you know, back to 2011, for example, you know, the graph that you showed there, where did those treasuries start to disappear from the, the, the custody account? In August of 2011, what happened in August of 2011? Well, August 9th, 2011, there was another one of those emergency conference calls on the Federal Reserve where they said, we can't believe what's happening here. We've got 1.6 trillion in bank reserves, and yet we're talking about bailing out the repo market because illiquidity is so, I mean, TAF auctions and overseas, we need to go back into crisis mode, even though we've, quote unquote, printed 1.6 trillion in bank reserves. Well, normally there's a really good inverse correlation between gold and the treasury market. And then we're going back a couple of years to 2018, it's almost perfect and you can see it visually. I mean, it's, it's a straight, it's almost makes a perfect X here. And even in, you know, I love how you brought in self-similarity and in, in, in variance to scale. It's not just a perfect X in the, law, in the, you know, the big time scale, there's also, you know, smaller perfect inverse, inverse correlations over shorter time periods. And what it, I mean, and that makes intuitive sense too, even though it doesn't make necessarily from the mainstream perspective, which holds that gold is nothing more than an inflation hedge. And that's not really true. It's actually a very poor inflation hedge. You know, you go back to the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, gold, gold performed poorly against the CPI. What gold is, is a, is a hedge against big errors. And the runaway inflation of the 1970s actually qualifies as one of the biggest errors in money and economics. So that's why gold performed well during the, the 1970s, once it was allowed to float in price, even though it had there was a two-tier pricing back to the 60s, so it sort of had broken away from the earliest day of the, of the great inflation. So it's, it's a big error hedge. But a big error doesn't necessarily mean runaway inflation. It could also mean deflation and fragmentation and, and monetary uncertainty, as we've seen since 2018. Because the big risks going back to especially November, October, November, December 2018 have absolutely not been runaway inflation, even though that's what they've all said in the mainstream media. Instead, we've seen inflation go down, the economy uh, slump globally, and yet gold prices were rising, often precipitously, as bond yields were falling. So we have deflationary signal in bonds. What's going on in gold? Well, the same thing. And it makes sense because, you know, gold's primary, the primary argument against holding gold is it doesn't pay any interest. How, so the opportunity cost to holding gold is, is essentially risk-free interest rates. So if you think risk-free interest rates are going lower and going to stay lower, the opportunity cost of holding gold goes way, way down. Therefore, that, that, that lends some more value and bid to the gold price. 
Deflation is money destruction, lack of money liquidity, lack of money in circulation. When there is a lack of dollars or U.S. treasuries, the world's reserve currency, in circulation, countries have to find a suitable way to settle foreign accounts, and they use gold. As is seen in the gold slams chart from the previous video, when these treasuries dry up in these foreign accounts, they have to sell their gold in order to acquire the necessary funds to be able to settle international accounts. And then once the liquidity issue is resolved, they rush out and buy more gold because they know that the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve, is not going to provide liquidity and they need to hurry up and get gold for the next shortage so they'll be ready for it. And wouldn't you know it, the all-time high for gold we've seen started in 2007 with the Great Financial Crisis. A huge deflationary destruction of loans and collateral in the system. Also importantly, gold started its rise from the doldrums of the 90s in 2002. Hmm, remind me, when did the U.S. workforce participation rate start to fall off? When did the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury start to really slide? Is this starting to come into focus for everyone? This isn't some odd coincidence. The fact of the matter is that the U.S. has been in a recession since the end of the dot-com bubble. That turned into a depression with the great financial crisis. And gold can tell no lie. Lack of dollar liquidity. Don't listen to our lying politicians and government officials. We are still in a depression, folks. People like Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, populists on the left and right respectively, are born and bred in depressions. The real story of gold isn't hyperinflation of the U.S. dollar. The real story of deflation is systemic economic capitulation and a populace who tires of the intransigence of its politicians. Thanks once again for coming and watching this video. I plan on having a try and keeping a regular timetable, and I'm not sure which topic I'll do next, but now with gold out of the way, it kind of opens things up to a wider world of ideas. Hopefully you'll stick around for the next episode. Until then, I'll see you next time.